session. So let me start with uh, good morning and welcome. This is Cooperative Skills Series 2022. And my name is Tiziana O'Hara. I work for an organization called the Cooperative Alternatives. So we are based in Belfast. And thanks to the Belfast City Council, we are able to bring it to the wider audience online a lot of webinars about cooperatives, anything about cooperatives. So we love cooperatives. We are a cooperative development body, and we have been operating in Northern Ireland, particularly uh, for the past almost 10 years. So in February, March, we look at the new cooperative emerging, and we had a couple of sessions on Azora Community Farm and Eden Dairy Village Energy. But also we did a couple of uh, um, webinars on cooperative skills on how to set up a cooperative and what are the best way to engage members. But for the next three months, we are very, very privileged that some of our uh, colleagues from the UK, very experienced practitioners, I must say, have decided to come and help us with some of the webinars. And we started today in April with the business in the community, businesses in the community, a cooperative ownership. What does it mean, really? How that is different from business as usual? And we have Mark Simmons that we will, will kind of introduce this topic and making also connection with the cooperatives in Northern Ireland so that you will be aware of the cooperatives that they are in Northern Ireland, the cooperatives that are outside our region, but also most of all, start to familiarize yourself with the different models. Please do, 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 do take notice of the coming forthcoming uh, webinars and in May with a fantastic woman called Abby Kenson, and sorry, sorry, my, and where we will discuss learning to disagree. And cooperatives are exactly that, how to manage conflict from different views. And um, after that, we will have another colleague from UK, um, Andy Cocktail Press, and uh, is uh, raising money the cooperative way. We will talk about community shares and we'll talk about long stock. That there are particular type of tools uh, open to cooperatives. And also in June, uh, Andy will come back and we'll talk about how you manage your cooperative finance so that uh, it's uh, easy for everybody to look at their finance and not be scared of. So you can see the program is nice to reach and we have a very good practitioners guy. You don't have to listen to me anymore. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. So the support is still available. Please uh, look at, at um, uh, our website again. We are cooperative alternatives. We are based in Belfast. Our um, kind of area of interest is Northern Ireland. We work occasionally in the South. And our, our colleagues uh, through the UK are very willing to also chip in and help with any kind of support needs that you have. So if you are thinking about cooperatives, do really think about, don't feel alone is what I'm trying to say. There is a lot of support around. The Belfast City Council has a program, Go Social. The, there is the highway that is a national program and the Copper Foundation has helped us to create programs to support in specific areas. So do ask, you don't need to feel alone if you want to go the cooperative way. But come here today. Cooperative skills today is with Mark. And Mark is really looking at business in the community and the cooperative ownership. We really wanted to understand with Mark what makes cooperative special. Thank you. And now I let Mark take over. Thank you, Mark, for coming. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Can you see that, Tiziana? Great. Okay. Uh, so that's me, Mark Simmons. Uh, and I am a cooperative development worker, same as Tiziana, and I work all over the UK. Uh, as part of a cooperative itself. Co-op culture is my co-op. Uh, and there's four of us in co-op culture. 
and two of them are even in Germany as well. So we, we actually work across uh, Europe. Uh, and I'm just gonna give you a little whistle stop tour uh, around business in the community and, and cooperative ownership, what that looks like. So, and I'm mainly gonna do that just with the uh, examples. So it's gonna be lots of pictures. Um, but before we do that, I'd be interested to know, if you're happy to share it, uh, who you are, if you're here as part of an organization or a group, what that group is, and, it, and particularly if there's anything you particularly like to get out of today so I can fine tune what I'm gonna talk as I, as I go through my pictures. Um, feel free to pass if you, if you don't want to share anything, but uh, um, I'd invite uh, Thomas to go first and then uh, Tabibu afterwards. So Thomas, are you, are you happy to say, uh, to speak to that slide? Okay, you're unmuted, Thomas, but I'm not hearing anything. Okay, I'll go to Tabibu. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tabibu. I am originally from Ethiopia. I'm currently studying masters in cooperatives, agri-food and sustainable development in Cork. Uh, and I'm currently uh, an intern with uh, Tiziana in corporate alternatives. And I'm conducting a research on the challenges of emerging cooperatives in the Northern Ireland. It's pre pretty much in an, an early stage. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually fairly new to the idea of the cooperative business model. I, I'm happy to be here and to learn more about it. Great, that's that's useful information for me. And uh, Thomas, do you want to have another go? Don't worry if not. Okay, not hearing anything. So either you don't want to speak or your tech isn't working. So, um, so I will pitch it. Uh, I'll pitch it to you to be that you are relatively new to the concept so i will you know well, let's define what co-ops are and why they're different and things like that rather than assume anything so um popping on to my next slide so we're going to look at what cooperative and community ownership is we'll look at some of the different sectors of the economy where the different models are currently used uh, as part of that we'll pick up as we go along how that's different from business as usual and at the end i'll touch on what is the process for setting up a community owned asset cooperative or business in the community? What does that typical uh, startup journey look like? Um, and that should take us up to the end of the session. Uh, I would encourage you to, um, if you are able to, uh, to chip in and answer, ask questions at any point, either if uh, sort of, oh, that's interesting, but what if this, or even I don't really understand what you've just said, can you explain a bit more? Uh, and if you are unable to to actually speak, then feel free to drop, drop your questions in the chat. And Tiziana, if you can keep an eye on the chat for that. So straight. Sorry, Mark. Yep. There is a, the message from Thomas in the chat. In the chat. All right. In, let, yeah. Let me, let me have a look. Uh, if I can actually see the chat. When you're sharing your screen, the chat goes down into a few moments. Ah, brilliant. So I'm an entrepreneur looking, setting up a social enterprise and two co-ops in Dublin. All oh, right. Ah, that's interesting. Right. OK, we'll pick that up later. Um, so straight into a co-op that. Uh, so I'm in West Yorkshire in the, the north of England, uh, and that's that's where I am. I'm actually uh, where I'm there. I'm about there in that landscape and there's about 20 co-ops in that landscape even though it doesn't look uh you know very well populated uh, and one of those co-ops is my local pub the fox and goose which is just about there uh and we bought this pub as a community about 10 years ago it was a failing pub um the the couple running it had split up and the the, the business had gone downhill uh they were failing to pay the mortgage uh, and us as the community, we stepped in and we raised the money to buy it from the bank once once it went completely bust. Uh, and we've invested in it, uh, upgraded it. Uh, we employ uh, six staff uh, as a real living wage employer. Uh, and it's now one of the most 
popular pubs in the town. It's going really well. It's just coming up to about its uh, 10th birthday. And um, yeah, and that's quite a common business model, certainly in England, Scotland and Wales. We've, we've got well over 100 of these community owned pubs. Have you got any uh, in Northern Ireland yet, Tiziana? Unfortunately not, Mark, and the reason is that uh, the licensing process is quite different mm. and uh, until uh, and quite draconian also right. because it linked in, in some kind of behavioral and cultural kind of laws. Yes, yes. All right. Well, there's 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 a challenge for you then to get the first community only pub in Northern Ireland. Um, the, the examples I'm going to give is I sort of cut across different sectors and different models. And, and so and conversely, we find there's some examples of, uh, for instance, like taxi driver cops. Northern Ireland was was ahead of the game and got them before we did. So it's uh, it's di different things are, are sort of because of the cultural differences and the political differences. You find different things sort of come to the fore in different parts of the country at different times, which is one of the reasons why it's quite useful to do this sort of like showing what's gotten in other places so people can gain inspiration and think, all oh, right, I could take that idea and slightly change it and use it here. So that's my local pub, the Fox and Goose. Uh, I was chatting to another pub this morning that are fighting a developer who's trying to uh, basically develop one of their local pubs into housing. So this is quite a big part of my work at the moment is working with community owned pubs. And moving on to a couple of Northern Ireland examples, although we have plenty in the uh, in uh, England, Scotland, and Wales as well. Um, wind co-ops and solar co-ops. So Drumlin Wind Energy, they own six 250 kilowatt uh, turbines um, and they raised 3.9 million pounds from a community share offer to do that. So they went out to the communities where these turbines would be, said, would you like to invest in order to generate renewable energy and get a small return on your money? So these are not necessarily projects that are going to generate you the sort of returns you might get on the stock exchange but they're around the community benefit as well. So it's, it's a way of using your money for community good. And similarly, uh, Northern Ireland Community Energy have done multiple share offers and they install solar PV panels onto community buildings. So, uh, and I've worked on um, similar projects here. Uh, for instance, in Bradford, I worked with uh, uh, Bradford Community Energy, where we were putting solar panels on the buildings of local charities. So it was it was getting them cheaper electricity, but also generating a small return for those uh, investors. And the nice thing about that was it was one of the first times we'd actually been able to um, create a share offer that, that was uh, acceptable to the local Muslim community because of the restrictions they've got around, uh, you know, paying interest on shares and things like that. So, and the community shares unit is now is building on that as well. Um, so lots of examples of that sabotaged a bit by the government a few years ago, pulling the rug out from underneath it. Um, uh, basically just throwing a bit of raw meat to, to UKIP basically by being seen as, as anti renewable energy, um, which sort of, pretty much stopped the whole process and it's only just now that the economics have changed enough that we're starting to see new emerging models of community energy but a great way to, to tap into money that's in the community to do good and you'll see that's common theme across many of these you're actually getting the community to invest in the businesses in their community uh, back to another example local to me um, this is a really exciting growth area. So social care is in a total mess. Um, uh, it's completely broken. Uh, and there are some organizations that are exploring different ways to approach it. And this group, Equal Care Cooperative, they're a multi-stakeholder cooperative. So we define a cooperative as basically a business that's owned by the people who trade with it. So a worker cooperative is owned by its own workers a housing co-op is owned by the tenants of the housing organization. Um, an agricultural co-op would be owned by the farmers who trade through it. Um, a consumer co-op so, uh, would be a, for typically a, a shop that's owned by the people who, who shop in the shop. And this is a multi-stakeholder co-op. 
So this is has two classes of member in it. It's owned and run by the workers, so the people who are delivering care, and the people receiving care or their families as well. So you've got both sides of the, trans, the care transaction there own this business. And then there's a third member class, which is investors. So people who just put money in from the local community to make the, the nice thing happen. So we've got three different classes of members here, caregivers, care receivers and investors. So this is quite a novel and interesting model. Um, and the, they're using the money from their investors to actually build uh, an online platform so they can the, all the, of the care relationship can be uh, mediated through an online platform, which some of the, the, the more sort of capitalist care providers are already doing this as well. They're finding that they can, you know, they can cut their costs by doing that. Um, uh, an equal care cooperative have raised nearly a million pounds to do this. And we're seeing other examples of well. So, so I've worked with a few multi-stakeholder care cooperatives now. But back to a Northern Ireland example, Belfast Food Cooperative. Uh, food cooperatives have been going for many, many years and, and they're, they're, they're probably one of the simplest forms of co-ops. They're basically just people coming together and pooling their buying power uh, in order to access food cheaper. So uh, certainly in rural areas, they're quite common. People will club together, put a bulk order from a wholesaler and get it in and then distribute it amongst themselves. Um, we've seen many examples all over the world of community supported agriculture projects where such projects go straight to the farmer. So they cut out the middleman um, and they buy their veg straight from the farmer. Then they get the delivery and they split it up amongst themselves. So uh, Belfast Food Cop is an example of that. It's uh, providing access to affordable uh, organic food and they have a pop up stall on the first Saturday of the month. Is there anything more that you want to add to that, Tiziana? You, you, you. Just that they were very brave. They started this cooperative during the COVID pandemic. And actually, even within the difficult, uh, um, the difficult period that they operated or started to operate, they were doing, they raised their profile quite a lot because they were doing a lot of community work and engagement with the community, especially around food and providing food, organic food where food banks were providing normal kind of ordinary food. So they were trying to bring and add value to the food that was distributed to the community in the most of need uh, people in the community. So interesting. Yeah, they are still yeah. growing. And that's really interesting because uh, people often say that uh, Times of crisis are times of co-ops because basically people have to band together and, and offer each other mutual aid. Uh, so uh, historically, that's certainly the case. I work with quite a lot of cooperative um, organic veg box schemes. Uh, and after the initial shock of COVID, they found that their sales almost doubled because people couldn't go to the shops as easily, but they could order in an organic veg box. So, um, and then post, as we reached the end of COVID, sales have dropped back by about a third. So they doubled and they dropped back by about a third. So they're still seeing the benefit of that. So that, that's been quite a, a shock to the system. Um, but yeah, quite quick and easy to set up. There's a, there's a movement uh, called Cooperation Town now, which is about helping to establish uh, food co-ops in, in uh, communities all across the country. So... <coughs> Again, another one that uh, Tiziana will be able to talk a lot more around. Uh, I work with quite a few uh, land-based and farm-based projects. Again, it's one that's raised money from the community by doing a community share offer. So they raised 184,000. Uh, they took on another 115,000 in loans. Uh, and one of the interesting things about raising money from the community is that it often allows you to access loan finance uh, better rates than you would do if you were going to try and finance the whole thing out of loan. So it's, it's quite rare nowadays for a cooperative and community business to um, finance everything around their startup from loans, but they often have uh, what we've actually got here is a three-way cocktail finance. So we've got some community shares, we've got some loans, and they've also got a grant on top as well. So that's quite common, that cocktail there. Um, 
Jubilee Farm sort of have a more of a sort of care farm model. So it's, it's, it's as much around involving people in the farming as, as just producing and selling food. Um, so they're big on agricultural and environmental stewardship. Um, and it looks like, I just popped this off their website the other day, uh, that they're about to have another share offer as well. So what you'll often find out is when an organization raises money to get started and then they sort of reach a plateau of where everything's working, is they can then go back to the community and say, right, we've proved it now. Can you fund the next phase of development? We need to grow. We need to take on new premises, etc." Can I add a couple of things? Yeah. Mark, just it can be interesting. Uh, so they do have a veg box based on a community support agricultural scheme. When you share the risk and you share the rewards of what the farmer is producing. But they also have a pig uh, kind of um, um, scheme for their members so you buy in advance the uh, the pig that at the end will provide the pork um, uh, to to your family so uh, those are the two things that they do livestock but also vegetable box and uh, the other thing i wanted to say you know those loans mark they were mm. all peer to peer loans all so right. no that's a kind of interesting isn't it because not only community share can kind of leverage uh, traditional loans from a uh, financial institution, but also leverage peer-to-peer -peer loans. And, uh, and in some sort of way, that kind of risk was shared between the investors and the people that was very close to Jubilee Farm. Yeah. yeah. The share of new share offer most likely will be to build a barn, a new barn near the, the, the existing uh, outbuildings. Uh, funny, in fact, uh, it took uh, almost three years to get planning permission. <laughs> I don't know if the same uh, market in, in England, but planning permission is quite an obstacle to some of our co-ops developing different parts of their operation. Uh, again, it depends on where you are in the country, but uh, the people find it, but the, the planning process isn't any more difficult because you're a co-opted. In fact, sometimes it's a little bit easier. Um, yeah, so I haven't mentioned up to now, but all of these projects we've put so far and the ones we're going to look at again is they, or while we call them all cooperatives, you know, they're different in that, that some of them have workers, some of them are multi-stakeholders, some of them have the consumers. Um, and some of them have different legal structures as well. But all of these ones that have done the community share offer, they tend to be constituted uh, as um, what are known as registered societies. And in this case, it's a community benefit society, a particular type of registered society. Uh, and they have the advantage is that they are allowed to go out and offer community investment to their community. Whereas if they did it, if, if anyone else did it, it would actually be a criminal offence to do it. So there are, uh, there are exceptions built into law for this sort of enterprise. So by virtue of their democracy and accountability, that they're trusted to go out and offer public, in, off, make an offer of public investment, including, you know, loans, which other organisations, more conventional business, for want of a better phrase, wouldn't be able to do without spending a huge amount of money and structuring themselves as a public limited company, which, you know, if Jubilee had Farm had done that, they'd probably spend as much setting themselves up as they would have raised from the from the shares to do it. And they would have created something that's not democratic at the end of the day. So that's farming. Uh, I've also worked with quite a few uh, community woodland projects over the years as well. Couple of examples of community owned breweries. So we've got Lacada in Port Rush. So they established themselves in 2015 with another community share offer of 60,000 pounds. They are structured as a community benefit society. And then we have Boundary Brewery in Belfast. Uh, they're more of a tap room, uh, but they've structured themselves as a cooperative society, which is the other one of the two forms of registered society. And they've done multiple share offers to, uh, to fund their development. And, and these are quite illustrative of those two different sorts of society. The Community Benefit Society, when it registers, it has to demonstrate that it exists to benefit the community, not just the members, but the wider community. Whereas a cooperative society, 
is more around that mutual self-help. It's there to benefit the members. OK, and in this case, the members are the shareholders and the people who drink in it. So this is more like a members drinking club where the other one is a brewery that benefits the whole community. And, and there's a bit of a grey overlap between them. They could probably each one could have just as easily sort of presented themselves as the other. Um, but uh, yeah, there is that line in the sand there. Uh, an example of a, a co-op now that hasn't done a community share offer, which is good to grow uh, co-op. Uh, and they're basically just a cooperative network of horticulturalists who are coming together around their own individual horticultural practice, um, doing seed swaps uh, and promoting urban growing. Um, so this is sort of looking more at, you know, it's still got that mutual self-help, but there, there's no element of sort of profit here. And, you know, they're going to be much more attracted to funders and things like that. Uh, Tiziana, do you want to add anything about them? If you don't mind, yes. And uh, again, a very new cooperative just formed in 2021, we'll say. And they just got, a, a, in fact, a, a grant from um, the Belfast City Council to do some work uh, with the community allotments uh, around the area. So they are going there, they share their expertise, and they do that with the Belfast City Council grant contract. Sorry, contract. So, yes, um, fantastic initiative. All very expert uh, women and women, sorry, all men and women horticulturalists. Thank you. Okay. And then zooming out a bit, and I've just uh, captured this from their website. Uh, this is Belfast Cleaning Society. So another example where Northern Ireland is sort of ahead uh, of us uh, over here. Uh, we don't have any examples that I know of of cleaning cooperatives yet. So this is, um, so, you know, we've got lots of people going into offices and doing cleaning, but they tend to do it on very low wages for, um, you know, private companies that are basically uh, just profiting off their labor, really. So Belfast Cleaning Co-op, uh, they offer the same service, but actually it's owned by the cleaners as well. So basically they are able to basically to drive the full value of their work as well. So we're seeing a real interest in this sort of cooperative about where you've got traditionally uh, exploited workers looking to create their own employer. Uh, another example is uh, quite a few uh, cycle couriers are looking to create their own courier co-ops. So rather than having to work for Uber or Deliveroo, they can work for businesses and have their own app and, you know, without being exploited in that way. Okay, so that's my last example. I'm happy to nip back and talk to more about that. And, and Tiziana might want to say more about Belfast Cleaning Co-op. Um, so the common features of all of these organizations is they're typically not for profit. Now that doesn't mean that they don't make a profit. In fact, if they didn't make a profit, then they would be making a loss and uh, you know, they would cease to exist over time. So it's the not for profit basically means is they don't exist purely to make profit. And they certainly don't exist to make profit for shareholders. And if there is any profit, that's either reinvested or it's shared amongst the people who generated the profit. So uh, in a consumer cooperative, that might be in the form of a cooperative dividend, because if a consumer cooperative uh, has made a profit, you could look at that as it's charged its customers too much for the produce that they bought. So by paying a cooperative dividend back, you're just saying, here's the bit back that you've overpaid. Or in a worker cooperative, here's the extra wages that we would have paid you in order you know, that we exactly broke even. So it's about what you do with the profit. Um, they are all democratic. So the members of all these organizations, whether it's just the workers or whether it's multi-stakeholder or whether it's the consumers, they democratic control the organization. Typically, they elect a board of directors to basically look after the organization uh, that reports back to them uh, once a year at the AGM. Many of them are community financed, as we've seen. So they actually uh, they go out to the community in which they trade and say, if you think this is important, then invest in it. And they often go back multiple times to do that. 
and they can pay a small interest as, as well. So certainly more than you'd get leaving your money in the bank. Typically the assets are held in common. So that means that the members can never, uh, for instance, like Jubilee Farm, if someone couldn't come along, you know, Amazon couldn't come along and offer them, you know, 10 million pounds for the farm, uh, they could sell it, but then what they couldn't do is then divvy the money up amongst the members. So that assets held in common ownership, uh, sometimes called an asset lock, basically removes any temptation for the members to uh, um, dispose of the assets and take the money away. So the assets are preserved, you know, in theory, in perpetuity forever. That that Jubilee Farm will always be there, owned by the community. And they're cooperative, so they cooperate. Okay, and there there are there are seven cooperative principles around democracy and concern for the community and education of their of um, of their members as well that they all conform to. So they they're generally nice things. They are they I would argue that uh, cooperative enterprise is the is the pinnacle of social enterprise, which is social enterprises is, a, is a, 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 are organizations that trade for a social purpose, but can be owned, you know, can be privately owned and can make lots of money for uh, capitalists. So they just happen to be doing having a nice product at the end of the day. Whereas these sorts of organizations, basically every, the social is baked in right the way throughout. And then I just wanted to show you the typical startup journey. So if I zoom in a little bit, so they typically start with someone, you know, has an idea, scribbles it down on the back of a beer mat. There's maybe a threat or an opportunity. So a, a bit of land comes on the market and the community thinks, oh, we, you know, we don't want that being sold off for housing. Let's buy it ourselves. Or we do want it to be sold off for housing, but we want it to be our housing. So let's buy it ourselves. Um, so something sparks the conversation, okay? Then there's often a, a research phase. So can we go and find someone who's done this somewhere else? You know, are they willing to talk to us? Can we go and visit them? Who else might be able to help? You know, in this case, you know, if you're in Northern Ireland, then you've got uh, Tiziana might be, you know, part of this first person you have a chat to. Uh, then there tends to be a planning phase. Okay, what are we really gonna do? Uh, or what do we really intend to do? Um, and you may be recruiting a few more people to help you at this point, because none of this is sort of like your dragon's den, you know, someone spends two years in their shed and emerges with a new widget and then presents it. You need to be involving more people as you go along here. And then it sort of splits into different things here. So there's the, the financing, how do, you know, how do we buy the asset? How do we uh, sort of invest in the equipment, that sort of thing? Where are we going to get the money from? A sort of bit around feasibility, and this is often a lot of stuff that I get involved in working with a group, you know, uh, and I was working with a community owned pub this morning. Uh, they were looking to take on the lease for a pub. And, and it was pretty soon obvious to us when we looked at it, that this developer was offering a lease at more money that, that they could ever run the pub at. So there's, there's no way they could have a sustainable business, but they just put it out there with this massive lease uh, in order to be able to then go to the planning people and say, well, I tried to get a lease, but no one came. So obviously it doesn't work as a pub, but they'd actually created a model that was destined to fail. So that will it fly thing is quite important. Or do we need to actually change it and do something slightly different to make it work? There's a whole piece around setting up the legal structure for it, because you need to, you need to create something that's going to buy the asset, own the asset, run the business, that all the people can be inside. And then there's bringing it all together it normally into a business plan at the end of the day. And then down the years, people get on with it. There's a period of growth. There might be another crisis and then another period of growth. So we might do another share off here. And sometimes even not all organizations last forever. So, so a little bit of what I do some is, is helping some organizations to die with dignity as well, rather than in, uh, in total chaos. So that's what my life looks like is working along all areas of these through various programs get funded to work with groups and Tiziana mentioned the particular groups that are available um, in Northern Ireland to do this. Um, and I'll just leave that there. I'll stop the share actually, but I can go back to anything. And so just to basically ask, is there anything in that that didn't make sense? 
is there, are there any questions that that's prompt that are relevant to you in your particular situa situation? Um, fire away. And Tiziana, if you want to add anything about Belfast Cleaning Cooperative, because I find them quite inspiring. Definitely, Belfast Cleaning Cooperative. Before before any, anybody jump in, has been one of the um, um, earliest um, cooperative that uh, we kind of uh, help uh, to develop in Northern Ireland around the 2011, 2012. Remember that before that in Northern Ireland, there was a very little cooperative development. It was only when we were started to looking around and a few people, including Mark, that actually helped us to understand a bit more, more about the cooperative model, we, we decided to, to try an experiment. So the Belfast Cleaning Co-op uh, practically was the first one that was created with a cooperative structure. The interesting fact is that is they are always paid the living wage and they did so from day one. And secondly, that they were able to win the contracts. So there was a, even the business that they were delivering was first class. So the fact that you are a cooperative, it doesn't exempt you from having good services, providing good services, creating good products. And that is what the Belfast Cleaning Pop has been doing for the past 10 years, really. So that's an important part of it. So they do contracts with who? With the Belfast City Council, the, the last I heard. Uh, the, the first few contracts they got was with music, I believe or not. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, with uh, uh, some uh, music first festivals, there were the, the people cleaning after a big festival were coming to Northern Ireland. So, um, and uh, they're still going strong. Mark, yeah. still the same, the same people involved uh, with much more people, cleaners actually become owners. Yeah, yeah. And they're a classic example of that, that cooperative advantage that together you can do more than you can do apart. So you can make a living as an individual doing cleaning, but you're not gonna win any of those big contracts. And if you're ill, there's, you know, there's no one that you can get to stand in for you, but doing it with a group of other people in, in the similar situation. And, and you know, we see examples of people sharing workspaces. So coming together and you know, taking over a whole building as a co-op and having individual workspaces and workshops within it as well. So have you got any questions for me? Uh, Thomas, you, you feel free to type into the chat. I've got the chat up, I can see it. Maybe, can I start, Mark? Yeah, yeah. A, a couple of, you don't mind me asking questions as well? No, more than very. <laughs> um, setting up a cooperative is, uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes engaging with the people. Um, what, what would be your suggestions, uh, in particular, you know, when there is a good idea, how to, to bring the people on board, um, if, if you don't mind, just as yeah, so, that. I, I mean, it will depend on the cooperative, uh, but it is quite important early on, because, uh, you know, if you're in that sort of the situation of like the lone wolf entrepreneur, and you've got a brilliant idea, uh, I would say if you've got a brilliant idea about setting up a cooperative and you but you're not going to be part of that cooperative then it's going to be quite difficult so much much easier if for instance you're in that you're a cleaner and and you just need to find other cleaners to set up a cleaning cooperative or you're a cycle courier um, so yeah i would say those early stages is just find quite a small number i mean you might be thinking there's potential that we might have a hundred cycle couriers you know in this thing in the end but actually start with three so i'm very i'm certainly with co-ops i'm a big advocate of what's known as the lean startup member uh, method so basically find a small group of people and find a way to start in a way that you get loads of learning so for instance you know if you think right i think belfast could do with a vegan supermarket as a co-op okay maybe start with a market stall with a few people so a bit like Suma Whole Foods, the, the biggest uh, equal pay worker co-op in the world, which is only about uh, probably 12 miles from me here, they started on Leeds Market. 
just selling lentils on a market store and now they're they're absolutely massive with a with a you know 15 people working in their export department so if you can find so find a bit few more people than you find a way to start and test your idea uh, if it's something that's got to be big from the start like you're buying your local pub for example then i would again get that small group of people but early on have consultation you know start a facebook group get some polls going do you know people really value this uh, you know what's important about it that sort of thing the stuff that allows you to then maybe go to grant funders and get an initial bit of uh, funding to you know um, maybe help you register the legal structure or set you know and set up a bank account that sort of thing so it's it's around baby steps and building up you know, you're not having to sort of, you know, write at the perfect business plan and then go and find a million pounds. You're working your way up to that and collecting people along the way. Does that make sense? Yeah, don't create empty co-ops. So write the perfect business plan and then think, right, I've got to find people who've got to feel ownership and passion about this find the passionate people first and then co-create the thing with them. And it might be slightly different to what you'd originally envisaged as, as a result of that, but those people will, that will then own it. In Northern Ireland, there is a quite a lot of um, um, confusion, maybe, or not confusion, but the, there is no distinction between in the social economy, between social enterprises and uh, cooperatives. Hmm. Would you like it maybe to explore a bit more what you were saying that you think that the cooperatives are the pinnacle of social enterprise? I'd like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So interestingly, uh, the cooperative movement was very, very uh, instrumental in promoting the social enterprise model when it first uh, uh, arose in the in the early noughties, um, particularly under the Blair government. They were very keen on social enterprise. And I think it was originally seen as uh, so we had sort of conventional business and we had cooperative business and um, cooperative cooperatives were often seen as too complicated and, and involving other people was you know uh, was, was hard work uh, so social enterprise was almost created for the a way of making charities a little bit more entrepreneurial but also allowing their sort of lone wolf type uh, philanthropic uh, person to be able to start a business for a social purpose but without having to have democratic involvement of other people um, and so Labour government really liked that. They created a whole new load of legal forms specifically for it, like the, the community interest company. Um, but yeah, I rarely work with them. Cooperatives can be defined as social enterprise. So that they ended up with a definition. The, the, the DTA did create a definition in the end, which was, uh, I think, business which trades for a social purpose and principally reinvests its profits. So 50% or more of its profits have to go back in, but 50% of it could go to the person who was getting rich out of it as a result. Um, and some cooperatives were not considered to be social enterprises. So if you've got that example of a co-op where if it makes a profit, it shares it back out with its members who have, you know, that, you know, you've paid too much for your food they were seen to not be social enterprise because that was seen as, as profit distribution, even though it was their own money. So there's a little bit of tension there. And um, yeah, so I find, yeah, but it's my personal point of view is that, you know, social enterprises are nice. They're certainly better than anti-social enterprises, uh, but that cooperatives are even better. But it's harder work to work with a big group of people. And that's one of the things in the workshop you've got coming up with Abby. It's really good. Abby is absolutely brilliant. I would really recommend, you know, even if you're not working in cooperatives, but you work, you, you have to, uh, you know, exist and make decisions with other people. Abby's, Abby's work is really good. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, we are looking forward to, to Abby and I know uh, and I know that she is an expert uh, on, on conflict resolution when you have to take a decision. But uh, it, it, thank you also for your opinion about, you know, social economy, how social economy, what social economy means 
in different kinds of structures. That's an important yeah. uh, distinction that we try all the time to make here in this region in particular. But uh, again, uh, it's a message that sometimes it doesn't really get through mm. because uh, there is this common kind of uh, label that uh, is not sophisticated enough sometimes. But can I say a little bit about growth as well? Yes. And another way where the cropped advantage comes around. So there is a tendency for when businesses are successful, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And certainly if they're a social enterprise or a co-op, there's a, there's a downside to that increase in size is they sort of lose contact with their original vision and mission. Um, and they lose contact with the people on the ground, the grassroots. Um, so one of the advantages of the cooperative model is you can get to a certain size and then rather than just getting bigger, you can just divide into two. Uh, so this is what Equal Care Co-op that I mentioned earlier on do. They're not going to gradually become Equal Care Co-op UK. They will help set up Equal Care Co-op in the next region and then the next region and will then create another co-op above it, what's known as a secondary co-op that looks after each of those. So that's one sometimes called a strawberry patch model. You don't grow a bigger and bigger strawberry plant. You send out a little runner and another loo little strawberry plant and you gradually, but you still, all, all of those individual organizations are really well connected in their local community. A really good example of it is in San Francisco. There's a um, artisan bakery worker cop called Arismendi. Uh, and they are uh, a collection of individual local bakeries where the people who work in them are local people and they provide bread for the local community. Uh, but they, as part of their mission, they'll help set up a similar bakery in other communities, which then becomes part of their over, overarching Arismendi structure, which actually is a cooperative development body in itself and provides support to. So they're the experts in setting up co-op bakeries. So rather than getting someone like me in who knows a little bit about bakeries, they got the experts there on the ground ready to go so they can replicate them. So you get this, you get this organic growth, but you maintain the, the local rootedness and the community connectedness. Well, I think I said that quite well, actually. <laughs> I might snip that out of your uh, recording and post it somewhere. It's really, really nice. I like this strawberry patch, actually, yeah. <laughs> metaphor. Uh, a final question. We talked about uh, um, the beginning of the cooperative. We talked about uh, the growth of the cooperative. Can we maybe spare a bit of time? What are the causes of cooperative ending in your experience? So uh, sometimes, I mean, they're typically the same sort of reasons that, that any business might end. So they've uh, they've you know, they've been successful, they've got an established market, and then the market has changed, and they haven't changed. Uh, and they've maybe left it too long before, I mean, often we get called in, uh, and, and we identify this crisis, because they're so heads down doing the day to day and paying the bills, they've sort of lost track of what's going on in the outside world, or they haven't got the capacity to step back and really think, well, actually things have moved on. You know, a tip, classic example would be um, online retail for traditional, you know, shop-based retailers and, you know, and not adapting to that. Or, you know, uh, probably a really good example. So um, traditionally sort of like whole foods and vegetarian and vegan foods, uh, there's been a big involvement of uh, worker cooperatives in that sector. Uh, and when they were really, really successful in the 80s and 90s, uh, you couldn't go into a supermarket and buy oat milk and soya milk. You know, you had to go to something specialist in order to do it. Now every supermarket has vegan this, that and the other. And it's not so much of a niche market anymore. So some of those organisations uh, are struggling now and are having to sort of revisit what's our unique selling point. We're no longer the only place where you can buy this. So... Fail, failing to adapt, what I would say would be a typical one. Um, sometimes overextending yourself. So there was a big cooperative uh, supermarket chain called Out of This World about 20 years ago in the UK. Probably it might even be a little bit earlier. They were going really well, growing, setting up new supermarkets around the country. And they just slightly overextended themselves in Newcastle, 
sort of uh, created a shop that, that didn't work, but they'd sunk a lot of money into it. And, and, and eventually it failed and took the whole lot down with them. So, yeah, they really took their eye off the ball there. Um, so these are all the sorts of things that happens to, to any business, really. Uh, and again, it, you know, it can be something as simple as COVID. I mean, um, co-ops have been really resilient. I don't know of a single co-op that's gone out of business through COVID. I suspect there will be a few, but nothing like the numbers of, um, of conventional businesses that will have gone down. And the success rate and the survival rate of property business is massively higher than conventional businesses. It's something like, you know, 80% uh, still going after five years, where it's only 50% for conventional businesses. Thank you. That, that's a give us a really an insight on the cycle of a, a cooperative life. So I, I think that we are reaching the, the, the point of closure. But uh, please, uh, before we go, if you wanted to say or contribute anything, um, very good. Thank you, Mark Viziani. It was very interesting uh, from, uh, from the chat from Thomas. Um, fantastic. This, again, uh, uh, will be part of the resources we are creating for cooperators around the world to look into what we are doing here and what type uh, of uh, uh, cooperatives we have here. So the last thing I wanted to say, um, thank you, Mark. Mark, as usual, to me, uh, uh, you know, you were my first teacher <laughs> and you're still teaching me. So thank you. Um, we hope to see, um, in, you know, more often here in Northern Ireland. Uh, certainly with more interest, uh, we need the more practitioners. And this goes to everybody. If you want to become a practitioner, please do join us. We yeah, need yeah. the people that uh, help the cooperators to cooperate. So come on board and um, and we will uh, have uh, more cooperatives on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Mark, the last word. Okay, yeah, no, that's a big part of my work now is training the next generation of cooperative development workers. So uh, yeah, yeah, and it'd be, uh, it'd be lovely to, um, to help that happen in- Across the world. island, maybe, yeah, Mark, yeah. we were talking about that, uh, you know, we are always interested. I know that we belong in two different jurisdictions, but we are uh, mostly the same island and similar kind of markets, condition. So Thomas and uh, Tibibu, you are in the South, the things uh, are kind of different for the South, the legislation may be different, but cooperation is the same. Cooperation yeah. is 150 plus uh, year old, and we have done it in the same way for many years. So, so um, Hopefully, we will form a more practitioner in yeah. the future, Mark. It's a promise. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm and sure that we will do it at one point. Say, definitely worth saying that that all that stuff around community investment uh, is available in the south. Slightly different, but still available there. Yeah. So the principle is the same. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we close here. Perfect. I'm going to get my dog now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Right. Thank you, Tabibu. Thank you, Thomas. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you.